The question uh, remains, <clears throat> are you ready to encounter the living God this morning? Are we ready to encounter the holy God that has preserved the scriptures for us to handle and to hold this morning? Are you ready to encounter that God uh, by uh, recollecting the Genesis narrative and the creation story and the creation narrative uh, itself? And I do hope that you've come prepared uh, this morning uh, to encounter uh, the living God. I love that question as it, it, it should be pervasive in all that we do. Pondering on the account of creation itself contained in the Bible is a very simplistic understanding of Genesis and creation, the creation narrative, or it can be one that is very perplexing. One, it is either, it's either or, it can be simplistic or it can be very uh, complex and makes one wonder. It's, uh, the illustration is, as uh, Jerome had stated, that the scriptures indeed are shallow enough where a babe can come and drink out of without fear of drowning. And yet we can swim out in the vastness of the scriptures, never cover all the area, never cover all the ground, never touch the bottom. That is the simplicity of the scriptures and also the perplexity of the word of God. You always learn something from times when I re would read the scripture and something uh, comes out into the text that the Lord wanted me to see for that particular time. And so it, it either is simplistic or it will boggle the mind. There is a, simplest, a simplistic understanding of the word of God that a child can read it and understand what God is saying. And yet there's some depth and some breadth to the word of the Lord that can boggle the mind. But God wants us to know him. He wants us to know him in a mighty way. Way. And I believe Genesis chapter 1 and 2 is much like both of those expressions of simplicity and yet complexity. And we're going to touch on just both of those this morning just briefly. Now you imagine if you, if you will, a photographer that's going to go to their, their session. They grab their camera. And they grab their appropriate lenses. The first thing the photographer is going to look for is going to make sure that they have uh, their the clothing. Uh, that uh, the... People that are photographed are going to have the proper clothing, they're going to have the proper lighting, uh, they're going to have the right lens. So any photographer is going to have the right and appropriate lens as to which to take the picture. And I would submit that Genesis 1 and 2 is much like that lens. Chapter 1 would be like the panoramic lens or the wide-angle lens. If you're looking at Genesis chapter 1, it's the wide-angle panoramic view. In fact, Moses lays out this beginning statement in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth as kind of like this statement. This statement of a matter of fact, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And what we begin to see as we travel through is this very narrowing in, a more of an in focus. The lens changes to a more specific areas of God's creation. So there's a panoramic scene in chapter 1 and then the focus of chapter 2 and some of the details therein. There is certain environmental characteristics that we're going to look for. And so the photographer finds the right lens for the correct setting. And so that it was, would be what I would submit this morning for us to do as well. To look at this uh, Genesis chapter 1, which I will cover this morning in that particular lens. This overarching big idea that Moses is writing. This magnificent truth that God is the grand designer, the grand creator. So he gives us this panoramic view. You'll also notice in your bulletin that there is an outline, a very basic outline of the way that we're going to handle the book of Genesis. Now in that, I'm not going to be able to cover all of that in a particular Sunday. So we're going to break this down into particular parts, uh, Lord willing. So this week we'll be in chapter one. And I, I, my hopes were to finish out chapter one and survey it. But as I began to dig into it and the Lord began to uh, reveal things in his word, it was just so rich that I just couldn't gloss over this. We, we, this is something that we, we need to share as a congregation. We need to share in God's word. And so we're going to take this and we're going to break it down and see how the Lord would lead us uh, in the study of this particular book. But then the first chapter, there is the God over the created order. Then chapter two focuses on the creation in a little bit more detail. Particularly Adam and Eve and zeroes in on, on mankind. And then chapter 3, which we will get into the fall of man. I will challenge you this morning, if you have a, a pencil or if you have a pen, maybe have a crayon with you, a piece of chalk, whatever it is. Take it out and, and write down on, on a piece of paper how many times you encounter the word God in this narrative. 
Now, we're going to handle 13 verses today, so make a tally. How many times we encounter the word God? And by the end of the sermon, you will see that the creation story isn't about the creation. It is about the glorious God that made it all and that we serve. Mark how many times the word God is used. And you may have a study Bible with you this morning, and that's good. You may have a study Bible with some footnotes in that. You may have some footnotes. Maybe you remember something uh, about the creation narrative in Sunday school. And you'll notice in your Sunday school curriculum, or even in your study Bible, they will explain to you that Moses uses the word Elohim for God. He uses a pluralistic word Elohim for God in, in Genesis, particularly chapter 1. Now, this word is a very strange word, a, a very unique word, and there's a few words that I'm going to explain this morning that are unique to Genesis chapter 1. It just shows you that we serve a good God and knew what he was doing. He stitched the word together. He knew what he was doing. And so he, he inspired Moses to write and use this particular word, Elohim. Now, let me sp- explain this word for just a moment. Elohim is a kind of a weird word uh, in the Hebrew language because it's describing God, but yet it is a noun that is feminine and it is also plural. So you have a noun describing God, it is also is feminine and plural, but more than that, this word is an expression of like saying King of Kings, Lord of Lords, God over all creation. Imagine Genesis expressing this magnificence of God, Elohim, God over all the created order, over everything. He is using the word to convey to the readers that this is a majestic God. There is none like him. There is no other living God. It is only him alone. And so he uses this word as like saying, Lord of lords, King of kings, and God over gods, if indeed there was any. Now, for the word of of the ultimate majesty and supreme majesty itself, as Moses is writing to this, you have to remember that he is speaking to the Hebrew people, the people who have come out of Egypt. They have come out of a land that was full of paganism, full of idols, full of other false god. And so, of course, Moses uses this word to express there is no other living God. There is only one. And so this is a word of majesty, a majestic word to describe the living God. See, God is the main character of the Bible. He is the main character of the scripture. He is above it all. And so Moses wants to convey that very fact. So pens, paper, crayons, piece of chalk, whatever you have, mark down how many times that we see this word God occur. And it will go all the way into chapter 2. But only in chapter 2 does he use a different word. And so there is some significance to that particular word that Moses uses. But this morning the question remains and I'll ask you again, are you ready to encounter the living God? Let us pray. Father, thank you today. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy, your overabundant mercy. We thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you for salvation. We thank you that the creator of all the universe, the creator of the earth, the the land, the sea, the the stars, uh, all the living creatures on earth is the same God who sent his son to step into humanity and put on flesh and to die for us. And so this morning, God, we want to get a glimpse of the Creator who sent the Son. We want to get a glimpse of God the Father, the the Creator and Jesus Christ, the Creator and the Holy Spirit, the Creator that He sent His Son into the world to die, Jesus Christ, to die in our place. We do want to thank you. Help us, Father, to see your creation and be in all of the magnificence of it. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So the first thing we're going to look at this morning is the creator and his creation. We kind of touched on this just a little bit. And this very beginning statement that Moses writes, he says, and many of us know it, we could probably say this by heart, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This is a statement. This is a statement that Moses is making. It's a general statement, but there has been much ink that has been spread on this particular uh, verse. In fact, in the beginning, God, there's been volumes written on just that one little phrase. Last week, we looked at the, the articulation of this verse and said that we could change it around and say, God, in the beginning, created the heavens and the earth. So there's an emphatic nature to this and what Moses is conveying to the readers. Then we go on to look at verse 2. And the earth was without form. And void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. 
Now this verse was written with the understanding, number one, that God is real and God exists. Moses didn't have to sit down and say, you know what, I'm going to prove to my reading audience that God exists. He just engrafted it in. He knew that God was real and God existed. He didn't have to write about the existence of God. It's ingrained in the text. So number one, the verse is about a living God, and this living God is all-powerful. This verse is an emphatic statement, but the rest of the Bible as well is an emphatic statement about who God is. Is it not? It's an emphatic statement about who God is and how we can have a relationship with this good and all-powerful living God. Now, we look at the word in the beginning. Just this word itself, in the beginning, is really one word in the Hebrew text. It's one word, and it's a very unique word. It can, number one, it can describe an indefinite amount of time. It can describe a thousand years. It can describe a million years. It can describe a moment of time. It can describe a billion years. The fact remains that the author doesn't tell you. The author doesn't tell you what this beginning looks like. It can imply an indefinite length of time. But the use of the word, it is clear that the author is not conveying the age of the earth itself. We can imply it from God's word, the age of the earth. But it does not emphatically tell us. But he is clearly, he does not try to do this. He, what he's trying to do is point us to the Elohim, to the God that is over it all. He's trying to point to the supreme God, the majestic God, the Lord of lords, the King of kings, the God over all. That is who he is pointing to in the text. And one can hardly read these particular verses by themselves without recollecting on the new heavens and new earth. This is what I call having a biblical worldview. A biblical worldview means if I'm reading in Genesis and I already know the story in Revelation, I'm thinking about the Garden of Eden. I'm thinking about uh, garden, the Eden that was lost, regained. I'm thinking about a moment in time in 21 that there'll be a new heaven and a new earth that will resemble Eden, but in a more magnificent and more perfect way. So we, we have a biblical worldview even by reading Genesis. We're recollecting on, on Revelation 21 and for verse 1 and follow. The beginning also points to the end, I might add. The beginning of all creation points to the end of things to come and a recollection and a recreation of things in the future. Number one, creation lifts up God, his transcendency. We're going to explain that just a little bit. For God is transcendent. It means that he is otherworldly. He is above his creation. He is not in the rocks. He is not in the sea. He is not in the trees. He is not in the land. God is not in those things. He is above those things of creation. He created it and he is far above that. He created it and is part of it, but he also is imminent. This verse here speaks of the imminence of God that he is uh, he seeks relationship with us. He seeks not only relationship, he pursues relationship with his creation. He pursues, uh, he's pers he pursues us. So not only is he transcendent and far above all the creation, but not part of it, he is imminent in that he seeks relationship with you and I, and he does that through the person of Jesus Christ. Now also another particular word that is very special in this particular text and throughout the Old Testament is the word you see for create. In this sense, it's created. Create is used in a special way, created. And at every particular time that this word is used, every time this word is used, is very unique because it is always associated, is always associated with God doing a creating work. It is always associated with God doing something. As David cries, to God and says, create in me a new heart. The same word is, is used there. It always has God as the main subject. It always has God doing a work of creation, whether it is uh, building a new heart in David or whether it is building the foundation of the world as we see. A very special word that is used here. And it goes to show you that Moses is saying that this is the only God that creates. This is the only God that creates. The gods of these fake and false gods around these surrounding nations, they aren't a creator. They can't create. It is only the one true God that can create. It also shows us this word that he created out of nothing. He created out of just the mere, his, his, his voice, just the, just the mere speaking yet. Well, where an ancient culture might say that creator needed a paintbrush, God was indeed, he made the paintbrush. You might say that uh, a god, a false god, had paints and they used the paint. Well, God made the paints. 
See, the point here is that God created out of nothing. He didn't need materials to pull together. And I believe we see this in verse 2. The author here is stressing that God is the center of the creation account and that he is retelling this to pass on and to pass on and to pass on and for us to pass on as well. Now, verse 2, the author is not trying in this case to let the reader know that the earth sat in space for millions and millions of years. This gets into what we might call the gap theory, where a person might say between day one and two, there was a, maybe a million years, two million years in there, a thousand years. But that's not what the author here is doing. He's not making that point. He's not trying to show you that the earth just sat there for thousands of years and then God, all of a sudden, he moved upon it. But he did move to create. So he's given us the perspective again that flows like a funnel into a more specific area, a more specific pinpointed area area of the days to follow where this is the first day the second day and today we'll end with the third so he's very focused in on what God is about to do not necessarily that the earth set out there for some millions of years but he's not even trying to make that point and many of have tried to say that there were millions if not billions of years between say verse and two verse one and two and frankly we are not told so we just don't stick it there and us as Christians should not stick that there Either. And the last week I asked a question, someone might say, well, the earth is 6,000, 7,000 years old, or is it 10,000 years old? Is it a million years old? Is it a billion, 4.5 billion years old? And the fact is, is, this, is, is it just old anyway, right? We ask the question, it's just old no matter how you look at it. So I think the question has a kind of a naturalistic background to it. God prepared the earth for man to enjoy. Not only did he create the earth for man to enjoy, but he put man in the garden to work it and to keep it, which essentially means that we are to worship God. He created us to be worshipers of God. Not only did God prepare earth for man to enjoy and to possess, but he has made us to worship him. Now when chapter 3 comes in, we see the fall of man that broke that relationship and it destroyed distorted our minds, distorted the very cosmos because of, of sin. And so he has made us initially to be image bearers and to worship him. Now see, God prepared this earth as he did for man to enjoy it and to possess it. And he also seeks a relationship with you and I. He seeks to be close to you and I as he walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the garden of the day. So he seeks us to have a relationship with him as well. But then we see the Spirit of God moved upon the earth, and breathed or spoke creation into being. Now the word here you see for spirit is another unique word uh, in the creation account because when the Hebrew would say it, it was very breathy. They would say this word for spirit, and, and indeed it intends to be the Holy Spirit. But when they said this word, it, it had this breathy sound to it. And so they would, they would know that they were talking about the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit of God that was active in, in the creative process. We could say that God spoke this word into existence, and the Spirit of God and the breathiness of that gives us that indication. Yeah, this is the Spirit, Holy Spirit of God that moved upon the face of the earth, and this movement sets us, the reader, up for the next verse. As we get question goes out, are you ready to encounter the living God? It sets up the reader, who would be the Hebrew people, the Hebrew people, and indeed us. It sets us up to be in face-to-face -face with the divine, creative force of the one true and majestic God. And not only that, the light proclaims God's glory. This light that we see in the creation narrative it proclaims God's glory. And so the verse reads, And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, and it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And he called light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. It isn't as if Moses is standing, on the, standing there watching God create all this. So he is retelling he is retelling the creation account for the generations of his people to retell and to pass on. And if one would get one little thing wrong in the creation narrative about God, they would equate that to being blasphemy. They would contain that and say, well, you're blasphemy using the Lord's name in vain. So they had a high reverence for the oral transmission of this story to make sure they passed it on intact, to make sure they told their generations to come with accuracy what God has done. 
And so they would pass it on with a high reverency and pass it on to their families. And these are recounted in six 24-hour literal days as the earth turns on its axis between night and day, darkness and night. Now, there's no reason why we see this word used for day is not a literal 24-hour day. And see, the problem with early interpreters and early readers of God's word, the problem with them was why, could God, why couldn't God do this in one day? Why couldn't God say, let there be light and all the world be created? The problem they had was why couldn't God just create? The problem we have today is it's not long enough. It's re- this because we're engrafted with this, idea, this evolutionary idea that we have to have evolution in place or we're going to look like some type of knuckle dragon Neanderthal that's trapped in our archaic past and, don't, and can't relate to society. So the question remains, did God need an evolutionary process? No, he did not. So I would say that these are six literal days, and God done just what he needed to do in the creation. And then it says on the seventh day that he rests. But see, it's amazing. It's amazing how culture and society informs our interpretation of the scripture. It's amazing how we interpret the Bible because culture says a certain thing. Homosexuality begins to interpret the scripture, and they they begin to refashion it to make it seem okay in the Bible. Society and culture begins to try to reshape and reinterpret the Bible, and so it has happened with the creation process as well. If you don't hear anything this morning, as far as our application, don't let society or culture dictate how you are a Christian or a Christ follower. Don't let culture or society interpret the Bible for you. Don't let the culture interpret the scripture for you. You read it for what it is. It's amazing how the culture and society influence our reading. Then there's no reason for Moses right here to write yom or day. And it means anything other than a full day. There's no reasoning here. We would have to imply deeply that this word means a thousand of years. There's no reason for us not to take this literally because in other places of the scripture, the word yom or day is used and it means the same thing. It means a 24-hour period of time, a light and a darkness. There's no reason for us not to believe that Moses meant a literal day. In verse 3, the first verse in the Bible where God speaks, the divine word of God broke the darkness apart. And light in the scripture many times reflects that there is a holiness uh, light does reflect, it says there's a holiness, and then the darkness in many cases would be uh, implying evil. But I don't see the uh, author here illustrating that the darkness here is, is overcoming evil. But it is an, over, uh, an otherworldly absolute holiness. There is an otherworldliness, an absolute holiness about God. The author isn't in try, trying to say that the, that the darkness here is evil. But as he is reading this, as he's writing this to his audience, they will connect automatically with light triumphing over the darkness. They will automatically con- connect with the, with the God of all, the God of light, into the world, overcoming evil. And so they will understand it uh, in that fashion. They would have understood uh, the darkness, if you will, and God's holiness breaking the darkness. Now God, over the created order in verse 5, pronounces a division of night and day and something later on, hold on to that thought until we get uh, to Adam and Eve and God sanctioning off to Adam to name the animals. Up to this point, God has named the heaven, the earth, he's called the night and day And as we see the animals introduced, God sanctions this off to Adam. As God names night and day and land and earth, he then sanctions it off to Adam and says, now it's your responsibility to name the animals. So we'll see once an action of God, he now gives us part in the mandate to be fruitful and multiply. And so he gives Adam a task to do. The the waters proclaim God's glory as well. The waters proclaim God's glory. We see this in verse 6. And God said, Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse or the firmament, and it was so. 
In verse 8 it says, And God called the expanse heaven, and there was evening, and there was morning, and this was the second day. And so the word expanse in this case, Moses describes the action of God setting boundaries in the world. His creative force is in a way like God throwing a blanket of water over the earth. The, the language that is used here is like as if God was to take a, for a, a crude illustration, would be to take a big blue tarp and just throw it over the earth. That's uh, the creative and divine process of God. And it was so easy. It was like throwing a blanket over the earth. So Moses has given us this emphatic expression that God created this world almost as easy as snapping your fingers. He sprinkled the stars into heaven by his very fingertips. And so why could he not take the, the uh, water like a blanket and throw it over the earth in, the, in this divine and, and uh, massive creative process that we see God uh, engaged uh, with? So he's creating a boundary, or what we would call an atmosphere of sorts. In the heavens there was an atmosphere, and also in the waters uh, as well. And so this big crude covering in a way if we would describe it as a throwing action. Now this is how Moses sees and how Moses is writing the creative power of this one true God over all of this. Just like the atmosphere in the heavens, there is also in the seas. As it is in heaven, so it is below in the sea itself. There's atmospheres in both, in both elements. And so Moses sees this creative, this grand creative um, process as we are reading this back to his, his readers. So here's a picture of a God that is over the heaven, a God that is over the seas, and then ultimately what we'll see is the God that is over the earth as well, and he is about to place his beautiful pieces of art in creation. And before the fall, and even now, God's creation is like a beautiful canvas, beautiful works of art, and you can imagine what this was like before the fall, before sin entered into the world. And as we see these beautiful pieces of art in God's creation, it brings me to the uh, point, the earth proclaims God's glory. The earth itself proclaims God's glory. And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together in one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth. And the gathering together of the waters called he seas, and God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass, and the herb yielding seed, and the tree, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is upon itself, upon the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, and the herb yielding uh, seed after his kind and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind and God saw that it was good and lastly in the evening and the morning were the third day so we get up to the third day and concerning the face of the earth God is about to decorate this earth with his works of wonder much like we get out a Christmas tree another crude illustration we get out our Christmas tree and we begin to decorate that every Christmas and a hassle it is to take that thing down but we see God, in such a way, has designed the earth, and he's about to decorate it, much like a tree. Decorate it with beautiful works of art, works of wonder. See, Moses gives the description of God pushing the water and the earth apart. Biology or geology might stress something to the effect of Pangea. We may have heard of this term. But we're not trying to get on that this morning and, and try to describe this one supercontinent other than this. That when we get to chapter 6... That occurs in human history, and that is the grand flood, the massive universal flood that may have even contributed in this if we indeed hold to something of this sort. But that's not the point we're going to even argue this morning, even a worldwide flood. But when we get there, we'll look at that a little bit more carefully. What we want to look at this morning is the land in this stage of early creation was the richest soil that one could find. We grew up not too far from rich lands. Many of you may have heard of rich lands, North Carolina, maybe 15, maybe 15, 20 minutes from my hometown, Jacksonville. It was called rich lands for a reason. They would take up the soil, the very early conception uh, of the town itself, and it was really dark, rich soil. I mean, real fertile land. And so we see this picture of this, the richest soil that one can find in the very origins of the earth itself. And the earth and the waters are, again, subject to the grand designer as he begins to push things uh, aside and begins to separate things. Now, we are again are reminded of this telescoping action, this panoramic and also the, the zeroing in or the focusing in. And that is occurring at the creation 
and that the created things are beginning to get zeroed in on and become targeted. So Moses, in a way, is depicting the Lord much like a farmer, that he is prepping the land ready for vegetation. He's prepping the earth, getting it ready for the seed that bears its own kind. And so by the time we get to verse 11, the ground and the natural progression of creation begins to be fertile and therefore allows for the animal kingdom, allows for humankind and to flourish. See, there's a natural progression to the creation narrative. There is a natural flow from the creation narrative itself. I mean, mankind and, and animal Animal kingdom could never survive unless they had vegetation to serve uh, their needs. And so between verses 11 and 13, the vegetation that we see is twofold. The plants that produce seeds, and number two, the fruit trees that were, the fruit was contained in those trees. If I was to go out and plant, plant, say, a peach tree, I'm not going to come back a few weeks later and find apples hanging on it. I'm not going to plant an apple tree and come back and find watermelons and hanging off of that, it would be pretty, pretty neat if I can get a watermelon apple mix. But, you know, that goes without saying that the fruit produces the seeds of its kind. And although the word seed here that is used elsewhere in Scripture indicates a procreation or keeping the generations going, it is not in this case used in that way. It is used in the literal sense of planting something in the ground. It springs forward. You grab those seeds and you reproduce and you replant those seeds. What science might call species, God calls kinds. And what we might call in, the, in, in science community, naturalistic science community, that calls something very specifically a species, we would say kind. So a wolf and a dog would be kind of a canine, a kind of canine, or a, a zebra and a horse uh, would be of the same kind as well. So what the world might call species, God calls kinds. So as we close on verse 13, and we look at the magna magnificence of, of creation itself, and all that entails in a lot of these special words that are used, uh, as Moses is inspired to write, our tally, if you've been taking count, of the name God or Elohim should be about 14 right now. Should have about 14 tally marks between 13, uh, verse, 13 verses, you should have 14. So what that tells us is that Moses was telling you something about the God that creates. The same God that is Lord over all of creation is the same God that tilled the earth so that it could be ripe for visit, visit, uh, vegetation is the same God that wants to have a relationship with you. The same God who threw the waters over the earth like a tarp and separated the land and the sea is the same creator that uh, wants to invest in your life and forgive you of your sin. He is the same God that created all of this, that sent his son, his son Jesus Christ. And I would add, as we read Genesis 1 and verse 1, if we're reading with a biblical worldview, our minds should automatically drift to John 1 and 1. And John 1 1 says this, The same was in the beginning with God. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And in verse 2, The same was in the beginning with God. John is, is lifting up Jesus Christ, the Word, the Logos, the Word that became flesh. In verse 3, All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. The person of Christ Jesus at creation. Matter of fact, when we see uh, when we see man is made, it says, let us make man in our image. The son there present at creation. Verse 4, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. So as we close and reflect on the creator this morning, who has moved and created all things, not only he is not a creator that is way out there and above all a creation that has no interest in your life, or he does, he is a God that, threw everything into motion and created everything with his, with his word. He created everything and spoke it. This is the same God who wants to have a relationship with you through the person of Jesus Christ. This is the same God who wants to tend your needs this morning, who wants to mend those wounds you have this morning. You might be suffering with adversity. This is the same God who created this. He wants to be integral in your life. You're struggling financially. This is the same God who wants to get in the middle of your finances and help you straighten things out. You might have a marriage. God is a God who wants to get in the middle of that marriage right now and straighten things out. He's the same God that created. 
is the same God who wants to be interactive in your life. He's the same God that came to save sinners in this lost and dying world. Would you bow and pray with me? Father, we do thank you this morning that you have, you have sent your son. Not only have you created all of this and we can stand back and be in wonder of this magnificent creation. And even though we haven't been very good stewards of your world, you have made it anyway. And it does still display your glory. We ask you, Father, that as we reflect on that, we understand that, that you want to have a relationship with us through the person of Jesus. If there's one that doesn't know you this morning. We ask you, Father, that you would, that you would begin right now to deal with them, work within their heart. Learn with, work within their mind and heart to bring them to saving knowledge in the person of Christ. If one here is struggling, if you indeed had the, the creative power and the divine creative power to put things in, in motion to create all this, to be sure you could engage in our lives. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. And as we do reflect on creation itself, the Creator sent His Son into the world. And so we want to take just a moment of time this morning and reflect on that at the communion table. As Moses reflected and recollected the creation story, we want to reflect, we want to step back and just reflect now on the elements of the Lord's Supper and what happened on Calvary's cross. So if we have our deacons come forward now, we'll administer the elements of the Lord's Supper.